Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Samantha Choles, and on behalf of Sawmilling South Africa, the Universities of Stellenbosch and Pretoria, Earthworld Architects, and the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition, we welcome you to the final webinar of 2003 um, in our Talking Timber webinar series. Firstly, wow, what a response. We have over or more than uh, four, 400 registrations. Whether or not all of those people will arrive, we will see. So either, of, either you have nothing to do at this time of year, or it was the CPD points that on offer that got you here, or maybe our sparkling personalities, whatever your reason, welcome. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, our team. This this is always a team effort. Um, our sponsors, Sawmilling South Africa, uh, University um, of Pretoria, and, and the York uh, Chair, York Timbers, uh, and uh, and as well as the contributors, we, I can't do this all on my own. I know nothing. Well, I know a little bit about timber <laughs> and wood and engineering, but um, I've got a great team of people like uh, Professor, Prof, Professor Brandt Vessels, Dr. Skull Krobler, um, uh, Bram de Villiers, uh, Philip Crawford. So yeah, that's it's they, we really um, are a team, and we pull these things together as a team. And of course, Roy Sadi um, from Sawmilling South Africa. Uh, just from a housekeeping perspective. Of the webinar will be recorded and it will be available on Sawmilling South Africa's YouTube link. I will post a link uh, once we get started and you can also um, access some of the past webinars. Um, we do have a Q&A function. I hope it'll work. I'll test it out shortly and if that doesn't work, we'll put our questions in the chat section. If I could ask that you keep your questions short and sweet um, and if they are aimed at a particular presenter, um, you can just mention them in the chat. We will also have a panel discussion discussion a little bit later on. In the chat, there is a link to a Google form where you will need to fill in your details for CPD points so that I could submit the register to the South African Institute of Architects. Um, then just so you, I'm sure if you have, or you should know that uh, COP28, I think it actually finishes today in, in Dubai, um, and there was an interesting announcement, but just before I go, get onto that, the purpose of the Talking Timber webinar series is to promote the use, preferably of South African timber that is locally grown, sawn, processed, engineered on South African soil. And, and about, it's about raising the awareness about the benefits of timber, and, and it's a key objective of Sawmilling South Africa, um, an industry association that looks after the sawmilling sector in South Africa. Um, and many of our sawmilling South Africa members are here today. Um, as I mentioned last week, there was an announcement that was made at COP that supported um, the need to substantially increase the use of timber in construction as a vital decarbonisation strategy. And the announcement was made at the COP presidency event under the auspices of the Forest and Climate Leadership par uh, Partnership. Uh, the announcement reads, uh, a coalition of 17 countries, I'm not going to read them all, but South Africa is not part of that, and we'll hopefully change that at some point in time. But they endorsed the following statement, recognizing that wood from sustainably managed forests provides climate solutions within the construction sector. We commit by 2030 to, advan to advancing policies and approaches that support low carbon construction and increasing the use of wood from sustainably managed forests in the built environment. And such policies and approaches will result in reduced greenhouse gas emissions and an increase in stored um, in stored carbon. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Skol Hrubala and he will do a, a few more announcements and introductions. Over to you, Skolk. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam. Um, Yes, thank you for joining the session and uh, thank you for all the presenters. We hope you will enjoy the sessions and we also look forward to spending the next hour and a half with you. A couple of announcements. The first announcement that we would like to make is that um, next year, the 28th of February, Wood Conference will take place again. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Wood Conference, uh, please follow the link in the chat box. Um, it will be good if you could also attend that. The Timber Design Competition was launched this year. We will uh, have our second edition next year. The Timber Design Competition is open to any students registered at a African um, School of Architecture. Um, so that's a new 
development is that it's now open to any architectural school in um, in Africa and not just Africa. If you would like to know more about the Timmer Design Competition, or if you want to get involved, please contact uh, Christoph van der Wiffen. Um, I've shared uh, his email address in the chat box. Please contact him if you want to get involved in that. Uh, that's quite exciting. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Sam. Oh, I can actually control it. Then um, the Wood app, uh, if you're not familiar with the Wood app yet, please visit the Wood app. It's also um, again shared in the chat box. So um, Stanbosch University is taking the lead there in developing courses with multiple parties. There are a number of, of courses available. All of the courses of uh, online courses are free. Um, and they also um, provide CPD points for those courses if you complete them. And then they have also started presenting one day workshops and uh, you will see the calendar is available on the web. So um, if you want to attend any of those sessions, please uh, make a note of it um, starting next year. And uh, we will also be planning to add additional events in um, in Gauteng and maybe across the country in the coming months. Then before we go to the speakers, we also make frequent announcements and posts regarding developments of um, timber construction in South Africa. Um, so we are also invited to either join the LinkedIn or the Facebook groups. Um, they are available and we give frequent posts of projects that is or events that's happening in South Africa. Then let's continue with the speaker. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Brandt Wessels. Uh, thank you for taking the time to do your presentation of um, timber products and what its purpose is and uh, how to test structural timber engineer products and treated timber. To give you some background, um, Professor Brandt Wessels has a PhD in wood science from the Stellenbosch University. He worked at the CSIR for five years uh, before becoming a lecturer. In the past 10 years, he has worked closely with South African sawmilling industry in several research fields, most recently focusing on the development of engineered wood products such as cross laminated timber from young pinus and eucalyptus trees. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Brandt Wessels, for um, taking the time to present this to us. And um, yes, you may continue. Everyone, so the title of my talk is How Do We Know If a Timber Product Is Fit for Purpose? And I will specifically be, uh, talk about um, testing timber, uh, structural timber, engineered products, and uh, also um, treated timber. Um, so uh, when a when an architect or engineer must specify timber, um, there are a, a host of things you will take into account. Um, maybe the most important will be your own experience, but apart from that, um, we'll also maybe refer to certification of a product by uh, organizations like SABS or SATAS. Um, maybe look at independent test results by um, universities or CSIR or SABS. Um, there's also uh, maybe a chance to consult experienced practitioners or technical experts, and some will even look at peer-reviewed research uh, results. Um, testing of products is usually quite costly, so it's sort of a last resort, but perhaps that's the most trustworthy um, method of deciding whether a product is uh, fit for purpose. Um, uncertainty and risk definitely play a role in this decision whether uh, whether something should be tested. Um, if there's a new uh, product, for instance, and there's not a lot of information around it, then um, the uncertainty is such that someone might decide, uh, uh, that the engineer might decide he needs some tests. Or if it's a high risk application, perhaps um, load bearings, uh, beams in a public building, um, then testing will reduce the risk of failure. Um, I'm first going to talk about testing structural timber and engineered wood products. Later on, I'll talk a little bit about uh, durability. Um, when you're testing structural products, um, there are a couple of things, very important things that you must realize. 
Firstly, um, engineers, when they design with timber, they need seven um, or yeah, they need numbers on, on, on seven design properties. Uh, you can see them on this slide. Uh, the seven properties, tension parallel to grain strength, compression parallel to grain, tension perpendicular to grain, shear parallel to grain, um, compression perpendicular to grain, and then the bending properties. Um, you can only test a piece of timber, of course, in, in, in one mode, since the, 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 the specimen will be destroyed during testing. Um, usually, uh, bending the bending properties, um, which is the bending strength and the stiffness, and tension perpendicular to grain are considered to be the most important uh, properties. So those are the ones that usually also get tested, but it obviously depends on what the application will be. Um, the second very important thing to, to realize with timber testing is that timber is, is variable. It's got huge variability in properties. And for that reason, you must use large sample sizes when you test timber so that you can capture all the variability. So typically up to 150 pieces of timber will be tested to get the, um, the characteristic value for one property. Um, the other thing is that you usually test full size graded timber. This is called in-grade testing. So it's not a laboratory um, controlled process. You try to test timber as it is produced at, you know, from the sawmill. Um, after testing your timber, you will get a strength distribution curve like the one that you can see um, in this in this slide. Um, so here you can see a typical strength distribution curve. The, the, the value that, that is used for design is called the characteristic value of timber or the fifth percentile value. So here in the slide, you can see that's the value where 5% of your timber will be weaker than this value. So that's been universally uh, accepted as a safe design value. So 95% of the pieces of timber will be stronger than, than that value. Um, and this slide just shows you the characteristic stresses for SA pine. You get this table in the, in the South African timber design uh, code, SANS 10163. And here you can see that the grades that's available uh, in South Africa for SA Pine 5, 7, and 10, and then all the characteristic values linked to each of those grades. Um, so when, when an architect or an engineer want to specify timber for, for a specific application, he's basically got three option, new options. You can test structurally graded timber, which has been graded according to the SANS standards. You can uh, use timber that has been graded according to another standard, typically imported timber, or you can specify ungraded timber or at least timber that's not been structurally graded. So, you know, in South Africa, typically what, what uh, engineers would do, they would prefer um, specifying uh, uh, SANS graded timber. So when it's been graded according to that standard, you will get this mark that you see in the picture on, on the timber. It will give you the name of the producer of the timber. It will give the grade there. You can see it's a grade five. And it will also show you the auditing organization that's auditing that a processor for its grading proce uh, yeah, process. And then if you use that timber, um, you can use the, the values for SA Pine that we had in the previous slide. So this is normally what happened in South Africa. And for this, of course, you don't need any testing. Um, secondly, you can, you can specify um, timber that's graded according to another standard. That would be maybe timber that's imported. So in this example, you can see this timber was graded um, with the EN standard. And in that case, it's also easy because the engineer will get the the design values for that specific grade uh, and use that. When you want to use ungraded timber or timber that's not been structurally graded, it's maybe graded for um, industrial purposes, then there are three options open to, to the engineer. So firstly, you can test the timber and you can get the characteristic values. That's the first option. The second option is to use proof grading of the timber. I will talk a little bit later about that. And lastly, lastly, you can use uh, various other criteria and make an estimation of the of the characteristic values uh, for that timber. Um, 
I'm just going to show as an example some of the um, projects we're involved in and wh what testing, um, you know, what it's like for, for, for these specific pr uh, projects. So in this first slide, um, I'm showing you the Greenpoint Educational Dome, um, of course, in Greenpoint that was completed earlier this year. Uh, for this dome, they, they wanted to use locally grown poplar, and you can see here a stack of, of the poplar that was used in the construction. And they had curved laminated beams. Here you can see the, the beams being constructed uh, by um, the supplier Mewa or the manufacturer. Um, and you can see the semi-finished dome in, in green point on this photo. Uh, the problem was that we do not have um, grades for poplar or um, design values that can be used for poplar. So the engineer asked ask us to, to test this, um, this resource. Um, and of course, these curved beams was mostly under bending stress. So our testing was also bending tests. And we, as you can see from, from these photos, we tested the timber on the flat side, which is not the norm, but in the case of glue laminated timber, the, it is actually loaded on the flat side. That's why we decided to go for this. Um, and then on, on the right side, you can see for the, uh, the, the MOE distribution of the timber that we tested, and we could, um, from the results, um, calculate the mean modulus of, of elasticity, and we could also calculate the fifth percentile or characteristic bending stress. And this we could send then to the engineer who designed the dome, and now it is um, standing and um, hopefully safe. Um, the second option, um, if you don't want to go for, for testing at the a research organization or university like ourselves, is to use proof grading. Um, proof grading is an industrial process and that takes place at the sawmill. Um, the, the advantage of this type of grading is you can use any type of timber. There's no specific um, rules like, like with other grading. So what happens is you, you stress the timber to the, the grade characteristic value. And if it breaks, then of course you cannot use it and it, you don't get this stock discarded, but it will maybe be used for something else. And if the timber don't break, of course it was strong enough and you can use it in, in your process. I've got this little video just to show you the, the proof grading process. So um, here you can see uh, the planks going through the, the proof grader. Here is a loading head. Um, the loading head apply force to the plank and that force will be equal to the, the characteristic value. And you can also see if, if the timber don't break, then of course it was strong enough for the application. Uh, you can also, when you look at this video, you can see that the deflection under the load uh, when the load is applied. Of course, um, some pieces of, of the timber will break here. You can see some of the broken pieces and that can obviously not be um, used in, in the uh, structure. Uh, the problem with um, proof grading in South Africa is that there are not a, a lot of facilities where it can be, be done. I think there's about um, two sawmills using this uh, type of process, but if you can get access to that, you can test any type of uh, timber in proof grading. Okay, so that was structural timber, but now if we, if you want to specify engineered products that like cross laminated timber, these are huge panels and it's um, quite expensive to manufacture. Um, so how do we test them? Um, fortunately for, for, test, for testing that type of products, you don't need the, the large sample numbers that you need for, for structural timber. In this case, we use predictive strength models. And as input, we use the, the, the great um, values that is in the standard. And then you just use calculations. But limited testing is still necessary. So most standards will require about, um, you know, testing about 10 pieces of the timber just to make sure that your predictive strength models um, are correct. Um, so in this case, I will also just um, uh, talk about the example of this that we were involved in. This is uh, MSc student Emir Jacobs, and in his uh, study, he tried to create S or he created SA Pine CLT strength values, which our local engineers can use to design CLT structures with. 
So the testing involved, um, it's a little bit different to structural um, timber testing. So minor direction shear test, major direction shear test, a photo of a major direction bending test and a minor direction bending test. And um, he tested 10 pieces uh, of, of uh, um, dimension for each um, for, for each test. So in total, it was uh, just about 80 pieces that was tested. That was according to the, the USA standard for, for CLT. Um, and of course, the important outcome out of this study was that he could produce um, these tables, unfactor resistance tables, which engineers now can use um, to design CLT structures with SA pine. So on this, um, in this column, you can see, for instance, if you uh, um, manufacture a SA pine CLT panel with S5 timber, and the layers are 22 millimeters each, so your total thickness of the panel will be 66 millimeters, and there are various options here that now, you know, the engineers can use. OK, then testing just a short um, uh, bit about testing timber products for durability. Um, yeah, so durability is often the reason why people are somewhat hesitant to use timber products because we know timber degrade in, in weather, certain weather conditions. So. Um, I just walked around my house to uh, take a few pictures of timber who shows signs of degrade, and I wasn't halfway, you know, around the house when I had all these pictures. So what you can see here that I'm not very good with maintenance, but uh, timber can actually be very, very good um, in terms of durability. Here I, I show you a, a photo of a pagoda in Japan. So this was very well designed. It was well maintained, and they used the correct products and this uh, pagoda is now already 1,300 years old. Um, for, for durability testing, long-term tests are definitely the best. So I just um, go, went onto the website of a, a relatively, well, it's not a new product, but it's it's uh, relatively new. It's called a Koya and I, I checked all the independent test reports that they provide for the for the product and here you can see them. So for instance, they they uh, did a 10 year durability comparison that was done in New Zealand by Cyan, which is a research organization. They did 15 and 20 year canal lining testing that was done by a Dutch organization. This product was actually developed in Holland, um, if I'm not mistaken. So that was probably some of the first test for it. You can see 20 year window L joint test, which was done in Britain and then some other tests done in the USA. So these long term tests are definitely um, the best. So if, if you have a very good uh, product, in most cases, they will provide evidence that the, the product was tested uh, by an independent organization. Uh, this slide shows some of the facilities we have available, available in Stellenbosch for, for, for testing durability. So for instance, here at the top, you can see a UV accelerated weathering test where UV lamps are used to see how well the products uh, perform when exposed, well, to the, in this case, UV lamps, but that's to, to simulate the sun. Um, this is a soft rot soil bed test, so you can see how durable the, the timber will be uh, in soil when the soft rot fungus is um, present. These tests only, the, the soft rot tests, for instance, only take a few months, so it's much faster than these long term tests. Here are 45 degree exposure tests. These can be long term tests, a couple of years. Um, this is a bond durability test that is for engineered products just to see how well um, the, the, the glue lines will um, fare over time. This is a very short term test. It take a couple of days to do that one. And here at the bottom right, you see a five-year wooden stake test. That's to um, to compare treated timber with some uh, naturally resistant species and see how they perform when when uh, in soil contact. Uh, then just some final remarks. So uh, testing need to be done where your available information on a product has um, a higher than required uncertainty for your application. It's always a good idea to use exp uh, an experienced testing team, so people that's already done these tests in the past, and very important to use where possible standard test methods. So many um, standards organizations around the world have methods, standard methods, and it's good to, to keep to these uh, methods where possible. And then lastly, wood is a variable material, so when you test, it's 
not a good idea to say, you know, I've tested two pieces and they lost, so they will be good. You must always maximize sample numbers, test as many as possible pieces. Okay, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Brant. Um, Sam, do you want to show the video now? Did you know, buildings and the construction sector currently emit almost 40% of energy related greenhouse gas emissions globally. Now imagine if cities could store carbon rather than emit it. Well, if we built more cities out of wood from sustainably managed forests, maybe they could. Wood is renewable and stores carbon for its lifetime, helping to keep it locked away from the atmosphere. Built with wood, cities could become extensions of our forests, helping to combat climate change and keep the planet healthy. Choose sustainable wood for people and the planet. Okay, uh, you are, Dr. Johan van der Meer will, will now continue with his presentation um, regarding the influence of timber material properties on structural design considerations. Uh, Dr. Johan van der Meer is a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria within the Department of Civil Engineering. He completed his bachelor's degree in civil engineering and his master's degree in structural engineering at the University of Stellenbosch and he obtained his doctorate at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland, or um, it's also known as the ETH. In 2019, his current research interests focus on timber structural engineering and improved circularity of building materials. And then just the last reminder again, if you want to ask any questions, please place them in the Q&A box so that it's easy for us to find them. Okay, Johan, you may continue. Thanks, Carl. Can you hear me? Yes, we hmm. can. OK, um, I'm, I'm going to. The screen is still not showing that I'm unmuted uh, or that my camera is going, but I'll assume that it is. Um, let me just quickly try and share. Things are looking a bit strange. So, Samantha, you have stopped sharing. I have. Um, mm. So you should be able to share. Let's. Uh, I'm struggling to. Um, I'm struggling to get any of the <laughs> options to work. Can you see me as well? Uh, we can see you. Okay, because um, I can't see myself somehow. I think let I might have to log out and log in again. Let me, I can present from my side into, for you. Uh, and then yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be, I, I would struggle seeing what it is. Would, would you mind if I quickly leave and log in again? Let's do that. Let's try that. Okay, and then maybe. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'll be back in a chat. Let's, okay, no problem. Uh, maybe uh, Skulk, while we wait for people, there are, we're, let's maybe address some of the, questions in the chat. Um, there were one or two that I pinned. Um, maybe this one for you, Brandt, uh, from Magdalena. Testing of ungraded timber. Do you need to test as many samples as you mentioned? I think you said you need to test it as, as many as you can. Um, if you could answer that question. Brand, can you hear us? Maybe. Let's just see what's happening here. Uh, can everybody hear me? <laughs> we can. Yes. Okay. No, yes, I fine. can. But um, I think there was a technical glitch that went through the webinar because I also had technical issues. Okay. So maybe Brandt and Yuan should also just maybe quickly uh, leave and come back. There we go. Okay. I told you Murphy would arrive uninvited. Um, <laughs> all right, let's just give everybody a few minutes. Let's see if I can maybe play that video again and while we wait. Although they may, maybe that's the one that threw us out. Ah. Hi, can you see and hear me? 
Yes, we can. Just sorting okay. out my side. Yeah, we can see and hear you. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Let's okay. try that one more okay. time. Um, I'll start sharing and please just let me know when you when you see it. We can see. Yes. There we go. Wonderful. Okay. okay. Thank you. Let me get going. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. So you've heard from Brandt um, about the several structural or mechanical properties of timber that uh, we as structural engineers are typically inter interested in. So what I will do in this presentation is to just link how those different material properties are used in um, structural design calculations. So I'll, I'll do that by first starting by giving you a bit of an overview uh, about the basis on which structural engineering design calculations are based. And then I'll run through three examples, just high level, to show you where those different mechanical properties of timber uh, comes into play. Uh, I'll, amongst them, there will be a, a number of calculations with numbers. Um, the purpose there is not to go into the uh, bolts and washers of, of the numbers themselves, but really just to, to serve as a, as a bit of a roadmap to work our way um, through all of that. Um, and then I'll wrap it up with some special design considerations which influences timber material properties and as such also um, structural design calculations. All right, so all structural design calculations around the world should at this stage pretty much be based on what we call limit state design. And I'll quickly show you what that means. So when we start thinking about structural design, one of the first things we need to think about is, of course, what loads will our building structures be exposed to? What kind of use, office, kitchen, laboratory, etc., wind or earthquakes even perhaps, snow or hail, so all the different types of loading that our building will be exposed to. Now, those loads will never be one specific value, but instead have some statistical probability distribution. So in other words, there might be a low number of um, very low loads that the building will be exposed to, and a very few instances of very high loads and a high number of loads that might be somewhere in between. So this is just the probability of a different load going from low to high. Now to make sure that we account for a reasonably safe approximation for the load that we design for, we choose a, what we call a characteristic value, which is at the upper, um, bound, or upper bound of the 90% confidence inter interval. So in other words, only 5% uh, will exceed that chosen value. And now similarly, maybe also linking with what you've seen in um, Brand's presentation, of course, timber material is inherent, inherently variable, but the same applies to concrete and steel, maybe to a lesser extent, but still the same principle applies. You never have only one specific strength, but instead some, most often a log normal um, distribution. And in this case, we want to make sure that we as, uh, assume a reasonably safe assumption for the for the strength. So we choose our characteristic strength value as the lower bound of that 90% confidence inter interval. So you'll see on the load, we choose the upper bound value as the char characteristic load or the effect. And on the strength side, we choose the um, lower bound uh, value for the characteristic strength. Now. You can imagine that if you were to narrow this distribution, that would be beneficial because what that would mean is that that would pull our 5% value over there closer to the mean. In other words, increasing the strength of the characteristic value that we need to assume. So what would be beneficial to this to structural design is if this variability was a bit narrower. So now you can imagine if we were just to say we don't care about uh, timber grading, we just taste any timber we can get our hands on, um, we could end up with quite a wide distribution of material with the fifth percentile lying very far, uh, very low. So we, we can narrow this distribution already through simple grading of timber. In other words, putting timber into different brackets of strength. 
so th that in each grading, we've got a narrower distribution of strength properties. But there's another way of narrowing this distribution, maybe even further still. And that's this is with engineered wood, uh, wood products, so CLT, glue lamb, et cetera. Now, the reason why engineered wooden products narrow this distribution even further still is because it provides improved dimensional stability, so reducing warping and twisting, et cetera, uh, reducing shrinkage. Um, but it's also got a, another major advantage, which I'll elaborate on maybe a bit more later down the line, and that is load sharing in that the different pieces of timber has different strengths and stiffnesses, but because they glued together, they can shed load um, between the different pieces of, of timber. Now, so, so what we after in structural engineering and, and in limit state design is really then minimizing this overlap between the demand or the, the action or the load and the capacity of a structural element. And we want to limit this to some economically acceptable limit. So not zero, but some economically acceptable um, limit. Now, what we do is we say that the design effect is equal to the characteristic effect, so that lower, or sorry, that upper bound characteristic value of load, we multiply by some partial load factor to increase it from a characteristic effect to a design effect, which we use in our structural design calculations. And then on the capacity side or the resistance, the design resistance equals some strength reduction factor multiplied by the characteristic strength, which was that lower uh, characteristic strength value that I showed earlier. So in other words, in structural engineering, we need to, on the one side, have a very careful th think about the load that we design for, because that will have an equally big influence on our chosen structure, as would the material properties. So understanding the different material properties that we can build with, uh, how do they fail, how do they work best to place the right material in the right place. So this still applies very much to concrete and steel as it does to timber. I'm hoping that in future we could expand our toolbox even further still. Um, but it's specifically on this characteristic strength um, side that I'm going to run through some calcs with you um, that's based on this table that you also saw in Brandt's presentation. Uh, SANS 10163 that gives us this table for South African pine. Um, of course, the different grades over here and the several mechanical properties. So I'll run through some or maybe fly through some calculations to just show you how these properties tie into the different types of design calculations and, and how they affect uh, the calculations. So to start off with, let's just look at a simple um, floor joist or maybe just a timber board spanning on its edge between two simple supports um, to support a floor structure above. So in other words, we, we, so when we start the design like, like this, we of course need to first have some thought to what loads we need to design for. So the imposed load based on the, on the building's use. Um, and then the structural buildup that will tell us a bit more about the additional permanent loads or the additional dead loads. We'll also have to make some reasonable approximation for the structural configuration, so some conceptual design. Um, so let's in this case simply just say that these joists or these timber boards are spaced at 400 millimeters center to center, or whatever you might think about that. Um, and so that each of these beams then are really just a simple spanning beam with some load going on top of it. So since we know the distance or the center spacing between each of these beams, we can simply multiply that spacing by the live load and dead load and add the, the beam's own weight to get to a distributed load on the beam for both ultimate limit state and serviceability limit state. So in this case, we're interested in comparing or, or, or calculating or checking the capacity of the beam against braking, so that's ultimate limit state, and then serviceability limit state to check, for instance, um, deflection. So if we know the span of the beam, so let's just keep, it, keep things simple and we say it's a simply supported beam, length maybe 4.8 meters, argument's sake, calculating the design effect for both bending moment and shear 
are two very simple equations, which is just a function of the load and the span. So just a pure analysis equation. So you can see over here, it, it at this stage, it doesn't matter whether it's timber, concrete, or even cheese, it's the same effect. We, got, we get some value for the bending moment and for the shear force. Now, of course, the bending moment and shear force doesn't happen in, at the same place. The maximum bending moment is in the middle and, and, and the shear force at the ends, um, but they also affect the structural material differently. Where, where bending, for example, causes uh, tens, tensile and compressive stresses towards the outer extreme fibers of the cross section, the shear causes a shear stress right at the center um, of the beam's um, cross section. So we've got the design effects, both bending and shear, and now we need to calculate the capacity. And this is where SANS 10163 comes into play in providing us with suggested equations to calculate the resistance. So this is, for instance, the bending resistance. And you can see the formula is some geometric function of the cross section multiplied by a ratio of down here some modification factors that I'll get to later. And then over here, importantly, the bending stress of the material. So now the material comes into play. And you can see that the, the bending resistance is a linear function of F sub B. So as you increase the grade, maybe rather focus on the first three, um, you can see how, how M sub R would also proportionally increase in direct proportion to an increase in F sub B. So if you go from S5 to S7, for example, all things else being the same, you'd get about a 37% increase in bending moment resistance. Similarly, for shear, the same thing applies. You get some um, geometric uh, considerations, such as the cross section of the, of the board, um, and then some modification factors and the shear parallel to the grain F sub V. And again, you can see that the shear resistance will increase in proportion to an increase in F sub V. So higher grades will give you a higher shear resistance, or similarly, if you go for a down a grade, all things else being the same, you might need a larger uh, cross section, for instance. Now, bending and shear aren't the only ultimate limit state design calcs that we need to, to check. An important thing also would be bearing. So imagine um, these timber boards of ours or these beams, because they're spanning on edge, say they were spanning between um, walls, for instance, because they're spanning on edge, the contact area between the beam and the wall might be very small. So that reaction force at the support divided by that, divided by a very small contact area could result in quite substantial stresses near the supports which could result in several different uh, failure modes depending on the situation, but notably through crushing of the timber material perpendicular to the grain. So in other words, a compressive failure perpendicular to the grain. Now, uh, the, the design effect for bearing is simply just the reaction force or the, or the shear force over here, which we've already calculated. And again, SANS 10163 gives us an equation to calculate the bearing resistance, which is just a function of the bearing contact area, some modification factor, and then the compressive for, uh, strength perpendicular to the grain. And I think by now you know where I'm heading with this. As you increase F sub CP, of course, so do you increase the bearing um, capacity. Or for a lower grade, you might need a broader um, beam to take care of the bearing stresses. Now, we also need to consider serviceability limit state, or um, in this case, maybe the de deflections of the, of the beam. Now, different codes have different ways of defining how these, um, how the different parts, what, what the different parts of deflection is that you need to consider, but they all come down to much the same thing in that you, you have to consider any potential pre-camber if, if it's applicable. And then some instantaneous deflection as well as creep effects that would ultimately lead to your total um, deflection. Now, designing for deflection in timber is, is not quite as straightforward as maybe with um, concrete. And that's because we need, because not, not only does the material creep, okay, concrete maybe creeps as well, um, but the deflection is a function of both uh, flexure as well as shear. 
So whereas flexure causes the upper fibers to shorten and the lower fibers to lengthen, which results in deflection, shear, shear forces results in this uh, shear deformation near the supports, which, uh, which leads to additional um, deflections. So this means that for timber, we need to consider these two parts of deflection, both under initial and creep effects, and we need to add them together. But you'll see in both of these equations, um, the deflection is simply a function of the load, the span, some geometric properties, so the I value or, moment, or, or inertia, uh, BH cubed over 12, A being just H times B, the cross-sectional area, and in both of them having some material property, the Young's modulus or, or E for bending, and then the shear modulus G for shear. Now G is linearly proportional to E, so you might see some function of E down here as well. And so it's this uh, elastic modulus or modulus of elasticity or MOE for timber, uh, which we're also given in SANS 10163. So now you can imagine that with an in that, that, that the displacement in both of these cases will decrease in proportion to an increase in E. So E going from S5 to S7, uh, you can imagine that you get a, 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 about a 23% lower deflection, all things else being the same perhaps, um, in going from one stress grade to the, to the next. So the one thing we couldn't look at in this example was compression. Um, so let's maybe look at a simple stud as a form of a column where these studs that are typically spaced at some regular center uh, is connected to each other, as well as to a, a, plate, a wall plate up there and a floor plate down there, which takes load from the top through the wall plate into the stud and then through to the base. Now, so if we know the distributed load on that wall plate up there and we know the spacing of the studs, uh, we can very quickly calculate the compressive force in a stud, so simply the line load multiplied by the spacing. So in this case, for this example, maybe to the effect of 20 odd kilonewton per stud. Now, a very important aspect to consider in structural design of columns is buckling. In other words, the tendency of a column to become geometrically unstable under some critical um, axial load. So in a stud wall like this, uh, you can imagine that it it's most likely to buckle out of plane of the wall, not so much in plane. So in this case, we only really have buckling about one axis uh, to take care of. And the way we consider buckling or, or take, uh, take that into consideration in our structural design is by looking at a slenderness value. So um, this, this lambda value, which is a ratio of effective length. So K times L being the effective length divided by the width of the timber beam or column, sorry. Now the effective length is just the, is dependent on the end restraint. So if it's uh, pinned on either end, K is one. If it's fixed on either end, K reduces the effective length. So buckling becomes less critical. But in a stud wall like this, I would argue you might be somewhere between these two situations. So you have some function of L being the effective length, which is slightly shorter than the real length of the column. Then SANS also provides us with some critical um, slenderness ratio beyond which the column is unlikely to fail in compression, but rather through geometric instability completely. And you can see that this limit is a function of two mechanical properties, both the MOE or modulus of elasticity, as well as the compressive strength parallel to the grain of the timber material. So depending, dependent on the slenderness ratio that you have for your column, SANS gives us different design equations. I'm not gonna go into all of them. They basically come down to something like this. It's a function of the cross-sectional area some modification factors again, and then the compressive strength parallel to the grain. And again, you can see that as F sub C increases, of course, C, uh, the compressive resistance increases as well. So we, of course, have also, diff th there's, there's different ways in which mecha the mechanical properties of timber can affect um, timber connections. And there are, of course, a multi multitude of timber connection details um, out there. 
And the way that we consider different material properties in our connection design very much depends on the way the connection is loaded. So whether it's loaded perpendicular to the grain of the timber material, such as in this example, or whether it's loaded parallel to the grain of the material, we'll consider them slightly differently. So let's maybe just look at two uh, examples. Um, if you, for example, have something loaded parallel to the grain uh, at a bolted connection where block shear failure can happen, so in other words, where a chunk of the timber might tear out of the tim uh, out of the board, um, this failure can only occur if it exceeds the shear capacity along these two planes, as well as the tension tensile strength parallel to the grade on that plane over there. And again, SANS 10163 gives us equations for both of those capacities, which are a function of some geometric uh, properties of the connection and then um, the, sh the strength values as well. So you see the tension, par tension parallel to the grain and the shear strength. And, and by now you know where I'm heading with this, right? So an increase in, in F sub V or, or F sub T will proportionally increase the resistance of each on each of those planes. We might have a situation where the um, connection is loaded perpendicular to the grain of a board running in that direction. And in this case, that tension perpendicular to the grain of this timber board over there as some geometric, again, some geometric property of the timber board, which I'm not going to go into now, um, and mod some modification factors. And again, the that the, 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 the timbers tension perpendicular to the grain strength. So now tensile strength coming into play, both loaded parallel or perpendicular to the grain. Now in all of these examples that I've shown you now, you've seen all these gamma factors that I've danced around uh, and not addressing. They are uh, provided for in the standard to make a provision for some very uh, very important and special considerations that affect timber material properties and also then, of course, um, structural design. So I'm not going to run through all of them now, but maybe just four of them. Um, first of all, uh, for gamma M1, um, if you think about how a tree grows, um, it, it's, it's loaded permanently through its own weight parallel to the grain. So it grows to be quite strong in compression parallel to the grain, um, but not as strong perpendicular to the grain. But but as it grows, it knows that there, there's going to be some loading in shorter bursts that loads it in different directions. And it is strong enough to resist those loads at shorter durations instead of longer durations. And so we also see that with timber mechanical properties where if it's loaded for a shorter duration, you get a greater strength than if it's loaded um, for longer durations. And so this gamma M1 tries to account for this low duration effect. And then also timber has some statistical distribution of strength and stiffness that you've seen now. But there's also a good correlation between strength and stiffness. So boards that are typically stronger are also typically stiffer. Um, boards that are weaker are typically also less stiff. And if, if there's many different boards uh, working together to support something that causes them to deflect uniformly, it means that less strong or less stiff boards can shed loads towards boards that are stronger and stiffer. And so this gamma M2 tries to make provision uh, for this load sharing effect. And then also timber has some strength reducing features throughout its volume and knots, for instance. Um, and you can imagine that the larger the volume of timber that you have, the more of these strength reducing factors there will be. So um, gamma M3 tries to or makes provision for the size effect in that larger volumes of timber will have more strength reducing features than smaller um, volumes. And then finally, um, gamma M4 makes provision for moisture content. So timber material properties are typically tested below a very certain um, moisture content. Um, and it's well known that with an increased moisture content, mechanical properties very often reduce, specifically compression parallel to the grain, for instance. 
And so gamma M4 makes provision for this effect of moisture content on the strength of um, timber properties. Right, so that's maybe just a, a quick and high level overview of how timber mechanical properties influence the way in which we design with timber boards. This, of course, I haven't touched on engineered wooden products, which I will, which um, I do believe is the future uh, for our bolt industry, uh, because of what you've seen in terms of uh, load sharing effect uh, specifically. Um, so that is all I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Van der Merwe. We will now continue with the question and answer session. If you have any uh, additional questions that you would like to ask, please place them in the Q&A box. We will now start with the first question. Um, it was more of a note, the importance of moisture content in testing. Maybe Juan or Brandt, you can add some information. Uh, I know you ended with that, Juan, but maybe you can just point out that a bit more and Brandt you as well. So how important is moisture content testing before you do mechanical testing? Um, scope must I or you are? Yeah, I think Brandt, you can ask on, uh, with scientists, so maybe it's good okay. if you start. Yeah, mo moisture content is very important. Some properties like compression parallel to grain can be up to 200% um, higher when it's dry versus when it's wet. So the moisture content is very, very important. For some properties, less so. Um, bending is less affected, but um, Johan showed these um, these material uh, the material factors, and so in in the in the equation, some will have a moisture content effect, have an effect, and other not. I think in the South African standard, only the the compression have a uh, moisture content effect in the in the thing. So, but it, it can be quite big. Fortunately, for structural timber, it's not so big. It's for clear wood and very high grade wood. It's it's larger. Okay, thank you. Johan, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I, I think exactly uh, nothing more to what uh, Brandt commented on. Okay. Um, yeah, but but I mean, that, that just does point out that with with timber material testing, you need to be sure that you not only have a high quantity of tests that you do, but also that you've got a good quality control over the, the testing that you do. So I think that ties into what Brandt also alluded to earlier, that you need to be sure that you have a competent um, testing agency. Yes. Then I think it's Marta Liana that made a comment on the quantity required to do testing. Um, I think the specific question was related to if the timber is expensive, then it's obviously more difficult to do uh, 300 tests. So any um, insights that you can provide on the uh, the minimum requirements for testing of material. Um, I think Yuan, you can start, and then Brandt from your perspective as well. Sure. Um, maybe Brandt can comment on the material specific side, but um, because there is this load sharing effect when it comes to going from a sawn board to some build up with timber, um, you very often get a significant reduction in the number of tests you need to perform going from a sawn board to a built up member to engineering timber. So at least the more expensive the build up gets, the fewer you at least have to test. So that's, I think, the, the benefit. Um, but, but, but I mean, do you, there's a big risk that you won't be capturing the relevant variability if you don't have a big enough sample size with your with your raw input material. Uh, Brandt, anything that you would like to add? Uh, yes, yeah. So no, the, the 150 pieces that I mentioned, that is typically what you will use to create that design table. Mm -hmm. So where you have the whole South African resource, you need actually you will need more than 150. You'll need for, for that. But when you, for instance, have a pile of timber that you purchase, uh, what you can do is if you do proof grading, then you don't 
you, you actually only lose the, the pieces that's too weak, and usually that's nothing. So you can grade it like that, and you, you don't lose anything. But uh, in fact, in most cases, when we test, for instance, I showed you that um, Greenpoint Dome project, we, we don't test that high number of pieces. So the engineer basically decide what's the risk that's involved. So in that case, uh, as Johan explained, this load sharing, it's a, it's a GLT beam. There are many pieces in that, and some will be stronger and some weaker. And it's only a single resource, so not so much variation. And then the engineer might decide, okay, we just test like 40 pieces, and it gives him an indication of which um, values he can use. And he will perhaps be a bit more conservative with what grade he, he select, but uh, very often not testing so many pieces. But I mean, if if you if you're going to, for instance, create a new uh, develop a new product and you want to put out values. Then you need the high, you know, really high uh, testing values. So it depends on on exactly what uh, what application um, your testing is for. Thank you. Then Mark um, Rotoblas commented um, nice presentation. Which other countries use our grading system for timber? Do you think it would make sense to adopt other international standards for timber engineering, such as the European norm of C14 to C40, or the GL grades in soft and hardwood from 20 to 34? Um, Brandt, you can maybe start on this question. Sorry, Skolk, I, I, I missed you a little bit there. Just uh, can you repeat? Yes, quickly? I will repeat. Um, you can also read it in the question and answer box. So uh, Marco Connor from Routerblast um, commended your presentation and then he asked which other countries use our grading system for timber. Do you think it would make sense to adopt other international standards for timber engineering, such as the European norm of C14 or to C40, or the GL grades in soft and hardwood from 20 to 34? Okay, uh, yeah, good question, uh, Mark. So um, nobody else use our, well, perhaps some of the guys importing to South Africa, if they, um, in, in the past, for instance, from South America, they, they, they exported some of their timber in large volumes and then they used our grading system, but that was because we were the market. But in South Africa, generally, we only use our own um, grading rules. It was developed specifically for SA Pine, so um, it's very difficult to, 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 to use grade, especially if it's visual grading rules on a, on a different species. Uh, there are other issues as well. It is a little bit of a... Um, non-tariff protection of your market as well. So the sawmills, you know, somebody can just jump in when uh, they want to uh, suddenly provide to South Africa. So there's some sort of work they need to do before they can use our grading rules. So there's some um, advantages and some disadvantages to using um, grading rules from countries. But generally, every country has got its own, own grade, set of grading rules for the species in that country. Uh, uh, Johan, would you like to add something? Um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe maybe just to to sort of add to to his comment as well. I, I think uh, there's there's also much to say about the grading of of hardwood as well, where where there's the D uh, grades as well um, abroad. Um, it it could be quite beneficial, you know, as the market grows and as the demand grows for both so soft and hardwood. I think that might be something that uh, could be beneficial to the market. Thank you. Then Isaac commented the testing of ungraded timber in a housing project. How does the building inspector confirm the correct use of ungraded timber looking at the three methods mentioned? Um, but I assume by um, by brand vessels. Um, so yes, you you cannot you can only use ungraded uh, timber in a structure if it's been approved by an engineer. So that you can't use the the normal building code and just use it. So it's only where it's uh, a, a structural engineer was involved where it, it can be used, and then uh, the engineer sign off on that. So that's how the building inspector they will will have to be a, a, a structurally approved design for that. But you can't uh, use it, for instance. Um, where you just build according to a, a building code, then you know you need to use the the national grades. Okay. 
Uh, Yuan, do you have anything to add? No, no, no. I think that that it's it on the spot. Okay. Then I'll go to some of the questions in the chat box. Um, I might miss here and there some questions. Um, the first question I noticed is from Ken uh, Lever. Um, uh, he says he's interested in two to four story timber construction for low and low middle income housing on the KZN North Coast. Testing facilities on the North Coast. I assume he's asking whether they are. And then uh, any advice on cross land panels for flooring and roofing again on the North Coast? Is any promotion and or testing being done on indigenous species such as Natal, mahogany, Bushman's tea, white stink coat or forest silver oak? I think let's start with the first part of the question. Uh, are there any testing facilities in the North Coast? Brandt, I'm not sure whether you are aware of any. No, not that. Yeah, I don't think uh, any of the universities test uh, do testing. Um, so I'm not aware of any testing. Well, there might be, you know, the engineering departments generally have strength testing um, equipment, but the, as far as I know, there's no one with experience in that, that type of testing um, on that side. Okay. Um, so we at Pretoria can test and the Installing Bosch University can test. I'm not sure whether. Um, Sarsfeld in George can test. Um, Brandt, do you know perhaps whether they can test? Um, I see uh, Richard, Richard Miller is. is uh, <laughs> can you? Unmute Rich? Richard Miller. Uh, okay, so I know Richard Miller at Sarsfeld, they do have an Instron uh, testing machine. So, yeah, as far as I okay. know, they, they can do tests. Oh, they, they can definitely structural timber i'm not sure about clt okay yes then um then any advice on crossland panels for flooring and roofing in the north coast uh, okay so um so i mentioned the the um, research that we did on clt from pine so as long as you use graded pine you can use the the design values that was created by Emir Jacobs. You can contact me personally if you need the um, the thesis, or otherwise you can also it's on 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 the university um, library website. You can offload it. So for any of our grades, they are um, already valid. So you don't need to do any additional testing for pine. Uh, for eucalyptus, um, we are busy with um, quite a, a lot of testing. So you can contact me if you need some um, help with that. Uh, CLT is, is is quite a high volume product. You, it's difficult to to you know do it with small volumes that we have available with indigenous timbers. So and and these, there are quite a lot of risks involved with the the bonding of CLT. So I would um, I would be hesitant to to go that way. Um, but if if you really want to use a specific species, there are tests that can be done. Uh, we can definitely do the the bonding, the bonding test and the strength tests. Um, but I, I would be sort of surprised if people go go that way with CLT. It's usually um, a structural product. You can of course maybe clad CLT with some high value woods and not include that as part of your structural values. Okay, and then um, is there any testing being performed on um, indigenous species like Natal, mahogany, Bushman's tea, white stink coat or forest silver oak? I know that at Pretoria we haven't started tests on this yet. We are obviously willing to do tests, um, but Brandt, have you done any tests on some of the indigenous species? No, no, we, as I've said in the previous one, it's um, CLT is a fairly high, it's not a low volume product, and these species generally don't have, you know, that much uh, volumes available. So in most cases, people use it for furniture, not so much for structural applications, but it is possible if, if you want to. Okay. Then. Okay, so here's a 
Brahm asked her where he can he taste the CLT samples in Gauteng. You can taste it at the University of Pretoria. <laughs> Thanks for that, Brahm. Um, what, what other South African timbers can be used for structural mass timber construction other than SA pine? Um, it, so SA pine can be used and then eucalyptus can be used, but again, I'll I'll give a brand uh, because you've got more background in this than I do, but you can maybe elaborate on this. Um, yes, thanks for that question. It's um, it's actually one of the areas we're doing a lot of work in at the moment is to use eucalyptus for for CLT. So um, the, the 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 answers seem to be very good. So eucalyptus seem to be an ideal species for CLT because many of the problems that you get with eucalyptus for structural timber you don't get with CLT. So um, in my opinion, it's a it's an excellent species to use for CLT. Um, so Thanks. Then uh, Derek Lubber or South African Woods, Pine and Seligna, competitive, affordable for a sustainable future in timber construction. Brant, I'll, I'll let you start. Just come again. Uh, so are South African Woods, uh, Pine or eucalyptus um, competitive or affordable for a sustainable future in timber construction? Yes, definitely. I think so. So um, um, I recently heard from some guys who, 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 you know, was just doing calculations with um, timber frame building compared to brick and mortar, and uh, the results are, are quite good. So you, you can be cost competitive um, if the structure is the same and your your insulation values for the house is the same timber performs well, so um, it should be competitive. Also for CLT at the moment in South Africa, I, I saw there was a, um, a question about the affordability um, of that. At, at the moment, it, it, it's true, it's a little bit higher cost than some of um, the, the CLT that you can get overseas, but um, CLT is a, is a manufactured product and it's heavily dependent on volume. So our factories at the moment is, you know, they've got fairly low volume. So as the volumes increase, the cost will come down uh, because the raw material cost is not more expensive than overseas and our labor cost is also not more expensive. So theoretically, we should in, in good time be a lower cost producer than, for instance, Europe and USA. Yes, Johan, maybe you can also comment on that. Uh, yeah, just maybe one minor comment is, uh, yeah, touching also on, on, you know, increased uh, demand is likely to reduce uh, costs, I think, in the years to come. And then if you also compare that with what's happening on this, on, on with steel construction, uh, you know, costs are rising very rapidly. So I see timber being a good option for many of the smaller scale things, especially uh, that we're doing in structural steel. And and then you've got the added advantage, I think, especially if you go uh, taller, that um, the reduction in weight that you get from the self weight of the material simply just also has a knock on effect on any supporting structure that's not um, even timber. You know, so even if you're considering additions, for instance, that also as as an effect. And then you also have to then um, maybe think about sust the sustainable future. I think the question really pertains to as it as it got a long-term future in terms of cost but when it does come to a sustainable future uh, of course there's several other effects um you know embodied carbon etc which which i think we're not going into now but yeah yeah then anthony skinner asked is there any guidance available for the calculation of in-plane strength and stiffness of stud walls acting compositely with the clearing boards uh Yuan, can i Throw that to you. Yeah, in in SA I, th I think with, with this might be allude to simple house construction. Um, I, I'm guessing. So I, I don't know of anything that's quite simple and straightforward. Um, maybe rules of thumb. So I'm not quite sure. I, I'd have to check and get back to you. Um, I, I would imagine for larger things, we, uh, we you know, as a structural engineer, I would rather do an elemental check on that. But I, I, I don't. I, I, I can't give a definitive answer now, but I do think I do remember seeing something like that in a European context. But I don't have the have any specifics uh, with me yet. But yeah, Anthony, I'll 
look into that and uh, be keen to get back to you. Okay. Um, then from David Cookson, what is the life expectancy for structural timber and how can this be extended to 100 years plus? Um, Brant, I think this is more in your um, field of play. Um, so, uh, you know, as I've shown you, some timber structures are really old, thousands of years old. Um, so the first thing is I think design is very important. If you design correctly, then there's no reasons to have timber houses that's hundreds of years old. And uh, there are a couple of things. So um, where timber is in, in soil contact, you will not get these long, really long um, life expectancy. So it, with treated timber, I think the aim is usually to have a life expectancy above uh, 20 years. OK, there are some of the treatment classes that can go much higher. Um, but as you've seen with that Japanese pagoda, if you have big overhangs, you keep water away from your timber, then it can go on forever. The big thing is um, timber is not good friends with standing water. So water can fall on your timber, but it must flow away. As soon as you form a puddle or the timber is standing, that's a place where fungi um, can, um, can grow and then you've got problems. So design is critical. If your design is correct, even untreated timber can last hundreds of years. Treated, uh, treated timber for some species, of course, is required, but for some not. But um, it is mainly a design, a design issue. Yes, Johan, maybe you can elaborate. Yes, absolutely. So, so, and in design, um, I would I would add that it's a conceptual design or an architectural considerations specifically because you want. You want a, a dry, drained, and, and, and well ventilated structure, really. Um, but then also in terms of durability, I think from a structural engineering perspective and, and building wise, um, I think it's also quite important to consider site control. So, I mean, quite intermittent wetting is not, shouldn't be a big problem, specifically with mass timber. Um, construction, you just don't want it to stand there for long duration. So your site control should just be very good to ensure that when it does get wet, you, you dry it uh, right off. Um, and then also as you construct um, that you also take careful note of um, building in your connections, because once those connections gets wet, it's, it's difficult to dry them out later down the line. So it's just all about um, site control during construction as well. Yes. Then uh, Carl asked, I'm working on an uh, under-roofing solution involving marine plywood. How does marine ply hold up to wood borer attack? Uh, Brandt, I think this is also more in your field. Um, okay, marine ply, if I, if I yeah, that's a, a plywood where you use adhesives that can withstand um, high moisture content. I am not 100% sure if they, it's always treated, but if it's chemically treated, then mm -hmm. of course it will be um, it will be a good against wood borer attack. But if it's not chemically treated, then it might uh, you know you might get wood borer attack on it. Yeah, that's correct. Then uh, Brahm commented and asked uh, the ability of timber structures to act as a shell structure when parts are glued and bolted together, or to Yuan's comment of load sharing is not always understood by design engineers. Is there better ways to simulate these types of design? Are we getting there, uh, Johan? Uh, yeah, look, Brown, the, the, the answer to that is, yeah, it depends on the level of design effort that you could also put into it. I think most engineers should be able to, to, specific, uh, to, to perform such calculations, maybe when it comes to composite kind of structures, so say steel timber kind of can, uh, structures. You could look into things like spring stiffnesses in between the different elements, but your level of uncertainty also grows with the level of an analysis complexity. So, you know, you might get to a point where you say, OK, listen, I, I know I've got a sufficient approximation, but I'll have to test things really to, to be dead sure. So I think as we go forward to more complex build ups and more complex structures, I think the um, testing would would be required specifically also in a local context to that, that, that we're sure that whatever is, get, ever is done abroad, for instance, with different timber types, that we also understand they're working 
um, locally. Um, and when it comes to engineered products, when we when we when we glue them together, of course, there it also depends on various different things: the glue, the build up. Um, so I think the the answer is really that you, you'll never you can only analyze to a certain degree without experimental validation. So uh, I guess that's I hope that's the answer to your question. Thanks. Uh, Danny Lane asked, are there any other sustainable African timbers that are suitable and competitive cost-wise for timber construction? Um, Brandt, I'm not sure if you are aware of any. Uh, yeah, I would like to answer that one. Look, I think what, what one must realize with is often people want to use indigenous woods or maybe wood coming from a, um, a natural uh, forest. In my opinion, that's not always the good, way, the best way to go. So in South Africa, the way we do plantation forestry, one hectare of um, of our plantation forestry produce the same amount of wood of between five and thirty hectares for most indigenous types of uh, forests. So tropical forests have fairly low um, volume. So in my opinion, the best way you can go in terms of sustainability is use plantation grown species then you protect up to 30 times more indigenous forest by doing that. So um, although we have timbers that can perhaps be used in small volumes and what, um, what um, sand parks are doing is they're basically just taking our trees that are busy dying. So it's 100% sustainable. If you can get hold of that, you can use it, but it's, it's really small volumes. In terms of imported uh, timbers, in my view, the sustainable thing is to use local timber in terms of uh, um, logistical costs. And also, if you don't know where that timber is coming from and it's not certified, um, the best thing you can do is to use plantation timber. It is 80% in South Africa um, certified as a sustainable way. It uses a very small land area in South Africa. Only 1% of the land is um, is plantation forest, and that way you save the important um, ecological uh, sites in South Africa, and that's not, um, you know, depleted. Okay, thank you, Brand. Then a comment from Richard Miller to Ken um, regarding test on the tile mahogany and others. Uh, see bulletin 57 from the Safri um, from Firen Banks and Store. They did a lot of indigenous timbers. If you need a copy, email me at Richard. Um, Johan, I would recommend that you also send uh, Richard the email to get a copy of those tests. Um, so thank you for that, Richard. Then um, Bram just made a comment. You need to optimize the material used in the structure to optimize costs smaller, lighter and faster. Um, then in terms of the timber design competition, I've shared Christu's email address again. So we are in the process of launching that. Um, we have the de some details confirmed. Uh, York Timbers will be a uh, funder again next year. We will open it to any university students from Africa. We are hoping to grow it into a professional competition as well. So. Um, Please, uh, if you want to participate in the competition one way or another, please contact Chris to van der Weffen. I have shared this email. Then Ken Lever, I think let's make this the last question. Uh, lengths of timber members are sometimes a problem, especially with exposed or decorative trusses. Do you need to test for scarf and or finger jointing? Uh, Brandt, maybe you can just elaborate on. Um, yeah, so um, it, no, 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 generally you don't. So if you see finger jointed timber, it um, usually, or in, in, in the case of South African pine, it went through the normal grading process. So there's no new testing uh, necessary. Uh, finger jointing in general is stronger than the weakest uh, defects uh, in a piece of timber. So it's usually not the weakest part of a piece of timber. So finger jointing is safe and you don't need a separate testing for that. Okay, thank you. Then uh, just please con continue with completing the forms that um, or the questions that Sam has posted. Uh, we would like to get some feedback from you. 
then I want to thank the presenters. Thank you very much for presenting and sharing your knowledge with the rest of the people attending. Um, Sam, you can close. Thank <laughs> you.